First Sergeant Cap here with Company D, 2nd United States Sharpshooters. Captain Ethan Whitehall, Company D, 2nd United States Sharpshooters. And today we are going to talk about our top 10 farbisms and kind of pet peeves yeah. in the hobby. It's not exhaustive, but I think this is sort of the, the things that always pop into mind first. Uh, we haven't shared each other's list to each other, so this is going to be kind of a fun little discovery. Yeah. Um, I would expect some pretty decent ranting going on in this video, so this should be entertaining. Nothing too harsh, just <clears throat> maybe a little heated at, <laughs> at most. Because there are some things I feel pretty strongly about. I'm somewhat opinionated of a person at times. Yeah, and you know, and especially too when uh, you're, you're a unit that really prides themselves in historical accuracy or trying to do things right. When you see people with a good good enough mentality, or if they had it, they would have used it. Um, it kind of it kind of bums out. It uh, it ruins our immersion, as, as we yeah. like to joke. <laughs> Quit ruining our immersion. Uh, so, uh, as you go along, uh, let us know in the comments what are your sort of uh, biggest uh, pet peeves towards reenactorisms, common farb that you see. And uh, so let's start with number one. Uh, highest ranking goes first. So number one, sunglasses. That's mine too. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, you know, I get it. It's bright out. You know, it's sunny. However, sunglasses weren't that common during the Civil War. And those who did mainly had syphilis. Or they were, like, sort of like rich socialites. Yeah, I mean, there were some, uh, like, sharpshooter or shooting glasses where they were glazed in kind of an amber color with a magnified center lens for to aid in shooting. That was about it. So whenever I see someone with sunglasses, I kind of always kind of joke with them, you know, like, oh, stay away from them, you know, they got... They got syphilis, stuff like that, and they never really understand why because they haven't done the research, but for me, the it's not just sunglasses, because if it is a modern-looking set, or uh, not modern, period-looking set, I kind of ease up on it because it's like, hey, you did some research into it, but it's always the modern sunglasses. You know, I've seen someone, that, I'm not kidding out there, with aviators. <laughs> I'm just like, all right, you're either a cop or you're Terminator. Which one is it? <laughs> but it is not 1863. No. They're the silver, you know, the polarized shades. and just... Yeah. yeah um, mm. You know, if yeah. you have, even if someone has period sunglasses, I'm still, they're going to get an eye roll from me. I'm, I'm yeah. going to throw them shade. Um, the sharpshooter glasses were rare. Yeah. Um, and frankly, if, don't wear them unless you, the person you're portraying actually wore them. Yeah. It's documented because a lot of serious reenactors will frown on you for wearing even period glasses. There are cases where they were worn and that yep. could fit with your impression. They're overrepresented. Yeah, or if there is like a legitimate medical reason. But again, there's where you can get the period glasses for that. And do you expect, you know, a little bit of mild hazing, but nothing serious, you know. Just expect the the occasional syphilis joke, at least for me. <laughs> Um, and, yeah, I would, yeah, transitions, I mean, I, granted, you, you, we, I wear glasses, uh, these are sort of my modern eyewear, we did a video on your face is farb, and it's like, a set of Very period frames is like 35 bucks, um, in the grand scheme of how much, this rifle is $1,500, you can, you can swing 150 for your period prescription, in the right frames it's readily accessible and if you're wearing modern sunglasses transition transition lenses it does not matter it ruins your entire impression it makes your entire unit look terrible because any anyone's going to see sunglasses in, in a even in a battalion photo yeah it's like what are those you know dark eyes oh they're wearing sunglasses so you really kind of ruin it for everyone. Yeah. So if you know if you're still rocking sunglasses, you haven't made the swap to period correct glasses. Um, it's a good investment. It, yeah. It, and, and no matter nothing you do with the rest of your impression is going to compensate for sunglasses. Yeah. You can have the you know all hand sewn uniform and you can look 100 percent the part. And the second those sunglasses are on, it's all for naught. Yeah. Which is sad. <laughs> yeah, and there's lots of lots of help. Like you know, there's lots of resources out there. Some people have a lot of success with contacts reenacting. 
Um, it was misery for me. Uh, black powder smoke and wood yeah. smoke just killed me. Yeah. So then I just went straight to period glasses, and I've been happy with it ever since. Yeah, and it's not uncommon for sharpshooters during the Civil War that wore eyewear. Mm-hmm. Like the actual glasses. Yeah. So it does happen. So that brings us to number two. So I'll do number two. Mine's kind of not in a particular order. But the one being a first sergeant that drives me nuts is people who can't march. <laughs> um, I don't know how hard it is that you step off with your left foot. You you follow the you know. I, for those of you who are watching this and are guilty of this, the reason the musicians are there is I'm right to side set. Dominant. I'm sorry. <laughs> is hate me for sergeant. <laughs> is to set the beat the the heavy drum beat. Left foot. Um, and you will jack everyone up behind you. Um, it, it's bad enough that I'm stuck behind someone uh, who can't march. It, it's, it's shocking to me because sometimes you'll get some like units that are really like super proud of their unit and their impression. They can't, they can't tell their left foot from their right foot. Yep. And what really sends me into a rage is... Uh, getting kicked in the back of my foot by someone else who can't march. Um, it's especially marching it next in line to this guy. I hear it all the time. Just quit kicking it <laughs> into step. Just, like, just kind of look over. Just yeah, and, and chuckle. Yeah, and it's one of those things that uh, part of our drill uh, that I lead. Uh, we're turning over a lot of drill over to our corporals, yeah. our platoon leaders. But I, I always lead the basics, and we will just practice marching in a giant square until everyone is in step, yep. and it is just automatic. Um, having dozens of people out of step um, wouldn't have been common during the Civil War. These are professional soldiers. Learn to walk. Um, <laughs> it's just walking. Yeah. And, just uniform to walking. Yeah, and once you stop thinking about it, you're always going to be in step. Uh, just pay attention. And... You can do a little shuffle. It's like sometimes you just get out of step. Um, there could be a, an a obstacle, rough terrain, any sorts of things. There could be a, a road apple. You got to get around. Do, do the quick little shuffle and match the step of the person behind you. Because marching isn't just like an annoyance between the person in front of you and the person behind you. It screws up the timing of the entire battalion. And that's when you get those nasty accordions yep. where one the unit who can march the... The worst is usually way in the back, you know, 100 yards, because they're, they're still trying to catch up. And if you stay in step, it's timed so that when you stop, you're in the right spot, you can get into battle formation and engage the enemy. So that's my number two. So my number two, and again, I'm next to him in the line marching, so I get to hear his complaining about not being in step. He gets to hear mine. Improper commands by officers. <laughs> That was probably one of my biggest gripes. Uh, mine's not really in order either, so this is probably one of my biggest, absolute biggest ones, is improper commands. So on the field, you'll hear, you know, by files right. Yeah. For some reason, that gets my drawers in a twist. Fix bayonets. Fix bayonets. <laughs> For some reason, people like to add S's to the ends of things. And it's like, no, it's by file. You know, this is your flank. This is your file. You don't have files. You don't have rows of people marching together. You're supposed to be in column of two or fours. By file. By file left, by file right. It's probably one of my more smaller ones, really. You know, fix bayonet. All right. Fix bayonets. Sure, I get it. You know, it's a plural thing. I, that, that I can let go. Probably one of my biggest ones is fire by file. Because that is the most <laughs> just completely screwed up one. And that's a basic command, too. It is, and... I, it's, not... a, it's supposed to work like a machine gun, right? Yeah. So it's, it's as fast as the next person can fire, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> ba but even then that's screwed up. Because you get people, bang, 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 and then long pause. So I'll, I'll go through the whole process of it, is when I hear file by or fire by files from the right commence fire. Oh, Fire by file is already supposed to go from the right to the left. There's no left to right. The, oh! Did you, did, 
they actually made manuals that covered this stuff. Did you know that? Amazing. <laughs> you know, it's not the... It's not in Casey's. Yeah, it is. So you hear that, and then they just unload as quickly as possible. When it's actually supposed to be a steady line, you know, bang. Go to uh, <clears throat> the ready position. Yeah. When that goes ready, bang, ready, bang. So And then they start loading. So by the time the very end person is done firing, the first person picks it up again. And there's no recover or anything like that. <laughs> and then, oh god, what are some of my other ones that are the improper commands? It's, uh... There, there's just a lot of made-up ones. Like, I, I've been in a nearby state, which shall remain nameless, but it's south of this one. Um, and <laughs> hmm. it was, like, I... Starts with an O. Yeah, I have no idea where some of these commands were. Like, it... They're not. They're not even inspired by a manual. It's just like I, oh, rally on the colonel's reserve. On you yeah. know, it's like uh, my favorite is the crossing of eras. There's a unit in our club that shall remain nameless that mix Revolutionary War and Civil War together. So we'll be across the field fighting from each other, and I hear present fire. Oh, yeah. Are we fighting the Brits? Yeah. Or where where are the red coats at? Where are they showing up? And again, when that command, when people hear that command, they I see everyone in our skirmish line just turn their heads at me, and I just there's a lot of that from all of us in our unit. Like we we catch those terrible commands, yeah. Um, um, and sometimes we're difficult. Like if a battalion commander like screws up a command, we're not going to follow it. Yep. It's uh, like why aren't you moving? It's like you didn't give a valid command. Uh, the other one, Counter March. Oh, yeah, Counter... God, I can't believe that thing still survives. It's There were certain commands for it, but it wasn't Counter March. It's not this whole U-turn, the whole battalion around, and, you know... Turn on your blinker. Yeah, it, there, <laughs> that wasn't an actual command. There were other ways to do it, but it wasn't that. And actually, a lot slicker ways to do it, because if you Counter March, you're screwing up your whole alignment. You're completely inverted because then you have to countermarch again to get it back. So you have to do this whole game of snake. And it's just, it's ridiculous. It's one of those things where it just doesn't. Uh, it's, yeah, I mean. The, it makes my head hurt and I'll probably die of a coronary once. Yeah. These, one of these times at an event and because it's going to be some bogus command that's given. Yeah, if you really want to like kind of go down that sort of frustrating wormhole of drill reenactorism. Silas Tackett has a great website. He's yes. written a pamphlet on the things that drive him insane. And it might be a good place if you just look up uh, Silas Tackett, Zepcon, you'll yep. pop it up. Uh, you may be guilty of some of these without actually knowing it. I um, definitely was before I started doing the research. And then when I did, I fixed that. And, you know, I, I'll happily admit, I used to do that. I'm yep. not ashamed to say, you know... You know, oh, no, I'm above that. I'm above that. No, I started somewhere as a reenactor, as a corporal, and as a first sergeant, and as a captain. But as I did my research, it's like, you're not supposed to do that? Cool. Yeah, and that's really sort of the thing. Like, if you know better, you should fix it. Yeah. Like, this, I mean, because it's tough. Because if you get, in some organizations, and maybe even your unit, you may not know it. Yeah. Um, there are, there could be things that have crept into your drill that have nothing to do with the Civil War. Yeah. They're just like your units or your organization's tradition, and you may you may be making a mistake. Um, I know we tend to get in the most trouble when we do something right. Yes, uh, and it's like, what are you doing? Uh, funeral honors is a big one that yep. we do right, and we get so much stink eye. It's like you're doing this modern parade stuff. Like there is actual, you know, funeral honor positions for yeah. the Civil War. It's in the manual. Have you read one? Or the one that we've done, and we actually get the biggest thing for it, is at the very end of battle, you know, Taps is playing everyone, you know, oh, uncover, uncover. That's actually not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to either go to rest on arms or present arms. You're not supposed to remove your hat. You're not supposed to, you know, bow your head. Because you're under arms. You keep your cover on when you're under arms. Exactly. <laughs> you're following military protocol and... You know, resting on arms, you know, having the barrel down, you know, hands on the buttstock with your head, you know, five paces forward. Or presenting arms is showing respect, you know, giving honor to the fallen. Yes, removing your cap is the same. However, military protocol, you're under arms. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's just one of those things. Read a manual. They're out there. A lot, a lot are free on Google Books. Check them out. Yeah. Uh, let us know if you have a question. We can probably help you out, too. Yeah. So, um, number three? Number three for me, uh, this one's going to make you laugh, Cutting Through Company Streets. That's uh, one of mine. That, oh. I, I lose my mind when, oh, people <laughs> just cut through the company street. Like, oh, I mean, it, it's not like, okay, if, like a three or four year old is like, ah. That, that that's one yeah, thing. Kids, but when you that. have someone who's been reenacting for 12 years, who's like, mm -hmm, and they're not even in uniform for one, usually. Yep. And they're just like cutting around our fire. They're knocking our stuff down. They're stopping to, I don't, some, sometimes they just BS with someone else. Yeah. From another unit in our company street. And I, I not just, giving proper greetings to officers or NCOs. Yes. Um, and, and just, I just go to this dark place where I just want to grab a log and throw it at them. <laughs> Uh, until I'm to the point now. Fire or on fire? <laughs> it depends on how bad it is. Um, and yeah, it, it comes down for me that one, you don't do it. Uh, there is protocol. These streets are lined, and you you gain entrance into a company street. Like that street is our home, and there's it's kind of like walking through your neighbor's front door without knocking. Yeah, or walk. You know, for me, it's like walking in the bathroom. You know. <laughs> It's just like, this is my house. Well, and some people are okay with that, though. Okay. Yeah, and so I, I have, like, uh, our junior NCOs and our privates kind of on, on, on the watch. If someone does it once, it's like, mm. um, And the second time, it's just like, arrest them. Yep. Like, this... It, it's in the protocol. It is in the protocol. Like, and, and so, like, when, I, when I'm at first sergeant's call, I'm talking to battalion. It's just like, come on, people. Stop walking. You, you got the company streets. You can go all the way around. It's not like you can't get from A to B. Or, or, okay, there's a special place for you in a bad place. The people who cut through the tents. Oh. <laughs> At that point, I will turn my sword into a javelin and I will try to spike someone as quickly as I can. Just, no. Yeah. Um, and I, I, unfortunately, I'm a very easy, super polite, sweet guy. But if you violate that, you will see a dark first sergeant. Yeah. And we do give, you know, at least a friendly warning. Like, hey, like, next time try coming down the street, ask permission first before you come down. And most people are pretty receptive of that. Yeah, and if you if you follow the protocol, I mean, you get the grand welcome. Like, oh, anything yeah. this unit can do for, you know, for if you just stroll in, it's like, yeah, we'll see about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Number three for you. Number three for me. You're going to love this one. Too much red and too much damn yellow. Oh. I, I get it. Yellow is for cavalry. Red is for artillery. Those were the branch designations. However, you see, for the most part, the red just really goes for artillery on both sides. But yellow tends to go more for the Confederate cav. It's like neon yellow. It's like it's party yellow. It's bright yellow. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things where, yes... Early in the war, there was that designation because, you know, you had these stores of yellow and you had these militia of cav and artillery. And, you know, they had their own uniforms, so they really wanted to show off who they were. But as the war went on, really past late 61, early 62, they kind of looked like everyone else. You know, you had cav troopers with sky blue trousers with, if they were NCOs, they had the stripe. Um, but a lot of them had the fatigue blouse. You know, some did have the mounted services jacket, so they did have that yellow piping. But they weren't constantly wearing yellow on yellow on yellow on yellow. And you'll see a lot of the, the Confederate, you know, cab riding around with the bright yellow cuffs and the bright yellow collars. It wasn't really a thing. They looked just like mounted infantry. Uh, yeah. You did have some militias that did supply uniforms with you know, black lace or yellow lace, but those quickly went away. And then with the artillery, you know, red shirts, uh, red hat bands, red feathers, yeah, yellow us, feathers. Let us know if, like, the red shirt obsession is a thing where you're at, yeah. too. Because, like, yeah, I mean, there were, from my research, there were a couple units that did have, like, one red shirt. Yeah. But then for the most part, and you, you can, there are some... Hardcore AF artillery units out there, light and heavy, and it is a standard U.S. Uh, infantry uniform. Yep, heavy is a little bit different. 
and the only red is their trim or their their rank. Their rank. Yep. Um, and the rest is standard issue. And if you read the 1861 uniform regulations, yep. it says the exact same thing. And I, I know for I, you shouldn't be able to get your uniform at Tractor Supply. I guess is what you should. Yeah, <laughs> you should I mean be to really put it bluntly. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot of. Uh, there's too much, and yeah, we even saw uh, uh, there's a, a photo on one of the organization websites, and there's a guy that has like a red kepi that he somehow found or had made yep. to go with his red shirts and his blue jeans. Unfortunately, <laughs> the blue jeans. <laughs> yeah, that's. We'll we'll get to that post war, we'll, by the way. We will get to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, but I think that kind of brings the whole thing is kind of being aware of dyes. Yeah, um, I mean, during the 1860s, you're looking at natural dyes that fade and age differently. Yeah, um, paints are going to oxidize different differently from that time period too. And so when you see just neon colors um, or people who aren't regulation, like you can look up the 1861 U.S. Army regulations. I think it's on Google, uh, and you can read. Uh, all of the exact specifications from the U.S. government. Yeah, and granted, a lot of soldiers didn't follow the regulations exactly. I mean, officers definitely had a lot more leeway. But they were kept in pretty close check for most of the war. I mean, later on, you know, when you're, especially when you're on campaign, a lot of civilian wear came in, but civilian wear didn't really have bright neon yellow or bright red. Well, there's, and, there was that orange butternut outfit that one year, too. Oh, yeah, the pumpkin uniform. <laughs> the pumpkin uniform. The pumpkin, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I'm i going to pick on our home impression. I mean, sh there's a lot of sharpshooter units out there that green on green on green on green. You know, there's the green canteen covers. Those did not exist. There's green haversacks. Oh, yeah. I saw that Those one. Those did not exist. Um, green feathers. No. I'm sure some of them even have green drawers. <laughs> I don't want to go that far. I don't want to think about reenactor underwear or other people wearing reenactor underwear, but I mean, we've definitely, you know, we've gone online, you know, just to check out how other un uh, other sharpshooter units do their impressions, and ah, uh, just, you know, yes, they did wear green, but they didn't wear green all the time. You yeah. know, there's documentation out there. And I guess it, what it really comes down to is people not doing the solid research and going out and doing their homework. They're just doing what, oh, well, you know, Sergeant so-and-so said, well, artillery wore red, so I'm going to wear red everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's just one of those things where it can be remedied with documentation and just doing research. And if you're an NCO or an officer, nip it in the bud. Like yes. if they if someone in your unit has a bad impression, bad uniform, get it out of there, keep them in camp, fix it. Like yeah. you're 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 not supposed to just let this get worse. Yeah. Okay. Uh number 4. Um I don't I don't know another way to like word this that drives me nuts. It's like like the El Banditos. <laughs> um, there are a few different types of units, um, where they seem to have four revolvers yep. on them at any given time. With at least three backup cylinders. Oh yeah, they'll have like a, a belt just loaded with extra cylinders and all they do is just, bah, 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 bah. and then they're out there for five minutes because they, they don't actually know how to put their cylinder in their, in their pistol. Um, Cav, so we don't mean to pick on you, but... Worst offenders is the Cav. At least out here. Yeah, at, at least, least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, see, you see a saddle going by, and there's just nothing but like gun belts hanging off of it. <laughs> so that Cav had rifles and Back. sabers. Imagine that. Oh yeah, and sabers. Um, and there's yeah, there's some other units that I swear like if there was like a gun shop Goodwill, like they just go in there with a with a gunny sack and just yeah. take whatever's black powder. Yeah. I, I you know I've seen. Uh, like a Howda once I've seen. I saw a Flintlock uh, once. Yeah. Uh, you can get all different makes. You get really sort of almost as like homemade janky ones that I would not want going off even near me for yeah. some sort of safety violation. Yeah. Uh, go easy on, on, on the pistols. Yeah, and what really it comes down to is, again, just that whole research aspect. Yeah, the I mean, long barrel ones. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, and it, you know, yes, you did have kind of your gorillas, your bushwhackers, and your raiders, and predominantly they did carry pistols. 
because they were going in really fast and coming out really close contact, but Cavalry mostly used the carbine as their backup, or as their main weapon. The pistol was your... Things have gone south. You know, maybe you're doing really close cavalry fighting. Yeah. But you only had six shots in your cylinder, and you had 12 shots in, you know, your ammunition pouch with six in each little uh, carton of rounds. After that, you had your saber. And if you're really getting close in with your saber, I mean, yes, there were saber fights, you know, Gettysburg, uh, First Manassas, Brandy Station, stuff like that. Yeah, you did have those times where pistols were used and sabers were used, but predominantly it was the carbine, and at least out here you don't see that. No, it, it's not really a Northwest uh, sort of thing. Um, yeah. And I, I say, you know, a lot of dismounted units are... Some some of the ones I've seen over time have been atrocious. Um, and also with safety, too, like packing them with grease. And you, yep. and you see, like, these little, like, grease fireballs shooting around as they're, like, cross-drawn... And, or, like, they'll have, like, the short stock. I mean, just, it's just the biggest hodgepodge of firearms that you can see sometimes out of these units that yeah. are just like, yeah, good, bing, bing, bing. Yeah, and that's the sad thing is, you know, granted, Dismounted Cav does get a bad rap in the hobby, but there are some solid Dismounted Cavalry units out there, and that's the ones that, you know, it's outlawed Josie Wales with six, <laughs> you know, they're just doing the New York, uh, the New York uh, reload where, you know, bam, 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 bam. They just drop them and then they just pull more. Like, this happens, people. We've seen a guy carry six pit and he's just pulling them out of nowhere. It's like, I don't want to touch where that revolver's been. I don't want to know what orifice that came out of. Yeah. Because they're just, and they have them on strings around their neck. And they're just hanging them down and they just pull them out and then they die because... They're done for the battle. Yeah, they, they can't reload in the field. And it's just the craziest <laughs> thing to see. <laughs> let us know if you've seen that before. Yeah, let, let us know your experiences. Okay, what's your number four? Too many officers or NCOs and not enough privates. <gasps> that kind of talks about like the some of the last units we were talking about. Yeah. You know, Cav is the biggest one. Artillery. The lowest ranking officer in a Pacific Northwest, uh, or the lowest ranking soldier in a Northwest Cav unit is the horse. Yeah, <laughs> gonna yeah. say it. Love you guys. Thank you for doing what you do. Yes, but... like the utmost respect to Cav and artillery for that matter, because they really have the biggest investment. Because, well, at least, well, really more so for Cav because they have to take care Gear, of gas, food. Yeah, and they have to take care of the horse year round. Poop. But yeah, <laughs> but you know, you'll see a unit of eight at the most in some units, and they'll have a captain, a lieutenant, a first sergeant, sergeant. Two corporals and two privates. Wow, when did you see two privates? <laughs> Is this sometimes. before me? <laughs> so, sometimes. Uh, they, they must have bought a new coat that day. So yeah. Probably yeah, the, the chevrons aren't sewn on yet. and You know, uh, with Cav, I, I somewhat get the reasoning, you know, well, they, they put a lot of dedication, so we make them an NCO. Do people not realize the backbone of the army is the private? I mean, you know... Some people might look at us and the sharpshooters, well, you have a captain, you have a first sergeant and two private, or uh, two corporals, but we also have a greater amount of privates to that, because the privates are the backbone of the army. Yeah, you can't, you can't be running two platoons with crap privates. Yeah. Uh, it's, the, the private impression is important. If you are a private, thank you for being committed to your rank. Don't be rank obsessed. Yeah, and I guess that's what it really comes down to is, you know, rank isn't everything. You know, the the higher up that totem pole you go, the lonelier and lonelier it gets, and the heavier and heavier, you know, those chevrons on your arms, or the, you know, either the rank on your collar or the rank on your shoulders really starts to weigh down. And it, you know, people think it's this glamorous thing. It really isn't. You know, you got to do a lot more work on and off the field and in the off season. Um, you know, I've covered a lot of that in my uh, duties of a captain video. Yeah, and if you if you have like eight people in your unit and every single person has rank. That devalues everyone's rank. It does. And in in other units will make fun of you. Like it happens. It you does. don't hear it. They're snickers. Um, yeah. It's it's kind of sad and it's the unfortunate part of the hobby. Yeah, you know? I, I mean, in in some units, if you have a small unit, all you need is an NCO. 
Like yeah. you don't have to be a colonel. You don't have to be a, a captain. Yep. You don't have to be a general. Um, you know, in our unit, our rank is scarce because we're dedicated to numbers. So yep. if we don't have the numbers, we don't need more stripes. We don't need more bars. Yep. Um, and it's also about skill. So unless you're competent and capable and have proven a list of leadership uh, qualifications and characteristics. Um, it's not, you're not going to get there. It's not yeah. like a gimme. It's like, oh, this is my second year. That means I get to earn this. It's yeah. like, no, in this company, these and these are hard earned. Yes. Blood, sweat, tears. <laughs> First one up, last to go to sleep. Yep. Okay. So what's your number five? Number five. And again, I want to sound like a first sergeant on this one. Bad drill, no drill. Um, That's one of mine. It's, for some reason, you know, in, in our organization, I'm seeing fewer and fewer units taking the, uh, taking the parade grounds and drilling. Uh, our unit, we drill sometimes two hours a day. Oh, easy. Um, last event last year, we drilled from breakfast until the beginning of the battle. It was funny. The skipper had to come find us because we were still on the parade grounds. We just lost track of time. Um, and and you, that, that shows. You have, if, you, if your unit doesn't drill... I'd say at least an hour a day, your your battle scenarios are going to be weak, uh, your uh, your impression is going to be weak, uh, you won't be able to like move and maneuver the, the battlefield yeah. very well. If you're not drilled, then the battalion can't operate as a solid function because that unit is dead weight. And the downside is you kind of become the joke of your battalion, if not your club, because... Um, Majority of the time the soldiers spent in camp was drilling. I mean, they were able to, it's just muscle memory. They practice it so much, so often, Read so a diary. many times. It was just second nature. They'd, they'd start to hear the command and they'd already know what is about to happen. If not hearing the command before even the officer is about to give it, they'd be like, oh yeah, yep, we're about to do this. Yeah, and also drill goes with safety. So if you're if you're not drilling as a unit, um, then you're going to be you're going to get progressively weaker and more dangerous with muzzle discipline, knowing your place on the firing line, Just uh, about safety, loading properly. I mean, if you want to see if you want a, a quick way to find a farb unit, uh, watch them uh, firing in two ranks. Oh my god! Okay, so you get that front rank on the knee, and you'll see those muskets pointed every which possible way. Yep. Uh, something upside down, backwards, um, and, and it's like, no, there's a specific way to hold your rifle when you load. Did you know that? Your sergeant should have told you that. Um, and, yeah, and so always drill. Like, it's, it's part of the experience. There's a lot of pride in doing it well. Yeah. A battalion will, will, like, allow you to do more as a unit if you're uh, confident and competent in maneuver. And, again, and also, too, if you drill, you prevent made-up drill. So, like, you know, that way you're not out there and you get all, like, you know, Call of Duty or something like that. Um, think it's some, you're some sort of modern spec ops group, you know, just like. Because <laughs> <laughs> that'll eventually happen if you, if you don't focus.